Okay, uh, wonderful. So welcome everybody to the panel on US inflation, outlook and policy response. First, an announcement, uh, Gita Gopinath was scheduled to speak on this panel, but unfortunately she's sick today and won't be joining us. So our three panel members will be in the order in which they speak, will be Jason Furman, Joe Gagnon, and John Steinson. All three are ideally suited to help us understand the current inflation situation. And let me keep my introduction brief since I think we're all eager to hear from them. Jason Furman is the Aetna Professor of Economic Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He served eight years as economic advisor to President Obama, including as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors from 2013 to 2017. Joe Gagnon is senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Prior to that, he worked at the Federal Reserve Board, most recently as associate director of the Division of International Finance. John Steinson is Chancellor's Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and is co-director of the NBR Monetary Economics Program. I've asked each of the panelists to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. That will be followed by discussion among the panelists and questions from me in the audience. If those of you watching have questions, please put them in the Q&A, which I will be monitoring. So let's start then with uh, Jason Furman. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much um, for organizing this great panel. Um, and uh, definitely miss Gita, but glad to be discussing everything with John um, and Joe. Um, so I want to organize my discussion around the question of why did almost nobody see it coming? Um, and what does that mean for um, what's next? This, of course, was the famous question that the Queen asked of economists after the financial crisis. Um, in some ways, I think it's actually a more fair question this time than it was um, last time. Financial crises might just be random things that happen from time to time. It's notoriously almost impossible to figure out um, when you're in a bubble and some systematic reasons as to maybe why you can. Um, whereas this was just basically your standard macroeconomic forecasting. Put in your monetary policy, put in your fiscal policy, put in you know, some things about demand and supply, churn out what the inflation rate was. Um, and yet everyone got that really, really badly wrong. Um, to give a sense of how badly wrong, I'm showing here um, first private forecasters. Um, this is May. So this is more than a third of the way through the year. The median forecast for core PCE was 2.3%. There were 35 forecasters. The highest one of them was at 3.2. They said the chances inflation would be above 4% were half a percent, less than one in 100. And based on, we still don't have the December data, um, but it's going to be 4.5 for the year is the actual number, possibly plus or minus a 10. Um, the FOMC in March was at 2.2. The highest of the 17 members for that was at 2.5. And it's not like financial markets did any better. I'm showing the tips break even for the Q4 over Q4 2021 concept. Um, on March 11th, this is the day the American Rescue Plan was signed into law, um, and it was 2.7 um, for the CPI here, whereas the actual CPI was 6.7. So. Um, basically, everyone missed this. Um, why? I'm going to talk about three different possibilities. One is everyone had the right models, but there were just some shocks that they didn't expect, maybe even couldn't have expected. Um, the second is that we didn't take our theory seriously enough, that the answer was staring ourselves in the face and we just rejected it. Um, and the final is it's something that's missing wrong with our theories. So let's talk about, you know, maybe we had the right model, but there were some shocks that we didn't anticipate. Well, there's a few leading candidates. Um, one of the leading candidates is Delta slowing the reopening of the economy. So I'm going to pick on Fed Chair Jay Powell an awful lot in this talk. Um, this is not remotely personal to him. I think he's done an excellent job. And he, he's saying what a lot of economists are saying, the outstanding economists at the Fed, private sector economists, other economic analysts. But in November, he said part of why inflation was high was Delta slowed the reopening of the economy. Because it slowed the reopening of the economy, it kept people more concentrated in goods, less in services, and that drove up inflation. 
Well, here's something really interesting. Just about six months earlier, Jay Powell said part of why we had so much inflation in April, May, and June was that the reopening of the economy was really fast. The vaccines were better than expected. The economy reopened faster than we expected. And because it reopened so quickly, um, we got inflation. Now, both of these views could be correct, especially if your theory of inflation centers around mismatch. But I think you have to be just a tiny bit suspicious if any unanticipated development is something that made inflation higher. Some of these unanticipated developments will actually make them lower. Um, I don't have that much time. My guess is that Delta was a shock that wasn't anticipated by forecasters. My guess is that it actually slowed inflation. And had it not been for Delta, the inflation miss would have been even larger. Um, that's a guess, um, I say more likely, because Delta almost certainly raised goods inflation and lowered services inflation. But the initial 2020 wave of the virus was very negative for inflation. If you look back at what analysts were saying in August, they thought it was negative for inflation. When Omicron came, oil prices fell a lot and the futures market uh, inflation break-evens fell. And it's important to remember service prices are five times as important as goods prices. So sort of all in, I think in Delta actually goes the other way from the story of unanticipated shocks. It compounds the mystery rather than helping to solve it. And to the degree it helps solve it, it only helps by a small um, amount because it's in there. Okay, number two, just closely related to number one, maybe it's even the same, um, but there's been a large shift of consumption from services um, to goods. Good spending was um, you know, extremely elevated and has stayed quite elevated. Now what's noticeable about this is a lot of the elevation of good spending is not directly tied to the virus. This is a big spike in April of this year. It's because people got stimulus checks. We know that what people spend stimulus checks on is durables. It wasn't that the virus got much worse um, from here to here. So a lot of what we're seeing here is macroeconomics in a normal environment, um, not the like. There was a big um, you know, reopening of the economy even as real uh, good spending continued um, to rise. And finally, you can't just simply say, well, if good spending had been normal, goods inflation would have been lower, holding services inflation constant. We don't want to think of inflation as 10 different micro stories. We want to think of it as a macro story. And if people were buying less goods, they would have been buying more services. And if they were buying more services, we would have had uh, more service um, inflation. Um, I think it's possible that this taste preference for goods over services has caused some temporary elevation of inflation. Um, but you know that high goods demand, we should have known people were going to spend stimulus checks on used cars. That's what people spend their stimulus checks on in the data. Um, and services inflation would have been higher. So again, maybe this explains a little bit of it. I don't think it explains a lot. And a lot of this should have been predictable. Um, third, perhaps the biggest story out there, it's obviously related to the previous two, is supply chains, the semiconductor shortage, the commodity shortages, the freight, and the like. Um, I think some of these are genuine shifts in of the supply curve, where it became harder to do something because of COVID. But I think more of these, including shipping, which has gotten a lot of attention, are actually not shifts of the supply curve, they're shifts of the demand curve. Um, this is US port import volume for the five largest ports. It shows the month in 2021 as compared to the comparable month in 2019. Overall for the first 10 months of the year, it was up 18%, that's a lot. Um, that is, looks an awful lot like the supply curve was fixed and relatively inelastic the demand curve shift and the quantity increased and the price increase. And so this is all a way of saying, um, we keep calling it supply shocks, but a lot of what we call supply shocks aren't actually a disruption to supply chains. They're just that supply was more inelastic than we might've liked. And when subjected to higher demand, we got higher prices. Um, let me now turn to the second bucket of explanations which is that we didn't take our theories um, seriously enough. 
I'm going to show you um, a picture that I used, I think, as early as February of this year, and I, I, I haven't updated it. Um, um, when I did the analysis myself and when I showed people, um, just to situate ourselves, the gray line is CBO's 2020 potential. Um, so we can think of that as potential. I'll in a moment explain why potential is probably lower than that. This was a December forecast that incorporated an understanding of the vaccines, but didn't include the December or March um, fiscal policy. When you layer the 0 0.9 trillion passed in December and the 1.9 trillion passed in March on top of this, um, what you get depends on your multipliers. The green line here uses um, CBOs, um, shows two sets of multipliers. This is their low multipliers in the face of non-pharmaceutical interventions. And then here's normal multipliers. Um, these happen to be the ones that we used at the Council of Economic Advisors, originally developed by Christy Romer. They're very close to the midpoint of what CBO used at the time. CBO had a high and a low. C CEA was almost exactly um, in the middle. Um, it's not obvious, by the way, that these were even the right multipliers to think about for 2021. If anything, people were sort of rushing out to take advantage of um, the reopening. Okay. Let me transform this picture and show you the predictions that our standard fiscal multipliers would have had relative to potential. Um, the orange is the normal multipliers. The green is the low multipliers. This is exactly the same thing I showed you a moment ago, but it's the percent of potential GDP. You know, we should have, and frankly, I was doing this exercise and did, looked at these numbers for 2021 and thought they were just shocking. You know, how could you in the second quarter of 2021 have output be 6% above potential or even have output be 2% above potential? in an economy with incredibly high unemployment, still supply constrained by the pandemic and sustain that level um, throughout the year. So if you are looking at the normal fiscal multipliers that we normally use, it told us that real GDP was going way above potential. We could have looked at that and said, hey, we don't think real GDP can go up that much. Maybe nominal GDP can. And if real GDP can't, well, what's the residual um, the residual is prices. You can do a similar exercise for monetary policy um, and the extraordinary combinative monetary policy and how it matters with a lag. Um, the second theory we didn't take seriously enough was hysteresis. Um, potential was almost certainly below CBO's pre-COVID forecast. Um, population in 2021 was 2 million lower than forecast mostly due to immigrate, less immigration and premature deaths. The capital stock was about 2% lower than trend. So that should be about two thirds of a percentage point off your level of output, just with Cobb Douglas, or about half a percentage point, since this is a private capital stock. It takes time to reconstitute labor markets and commercial networks. Um, and productivity can go either way. Work from home maybe helps it, maybe it hurts it. COVID mitigation um, hurts it. And so the picture I showed you here in some ways is even more favorable because it assumes we could get back to our pre-pandemic potential by 2021, hysteresis says no. Hysteresis also affects the way we think about labor markets. Um, in April, Jay Powell, again, expressing a view that was very, very common at the time, says it's hard to see inflation moving up while there's significant slack in the labor market. Well, what was the Nehru in 20, April 2021? I think that the Nehru might eventually be 3.5% is very plausible. That it was 3.5% two years ago is very plausible. But there's no way we could have gotten to 3.5% unemployment in April. Um, it's just way too far to move too quickly. So um, this now brings me to something that's missing or wrong with our theories. And you know, this is frankly a little bit of ambiguity as to what I classify as not taking our theories seriously enough versus missing or wrong, because almost everything I have that's missing or wrong, we sort of were aware of prior to this. So there's a little bit of blurring and arbitrariness in these categories. Well, one thing is most people, most of the time, look at 
unemployment rate as their primary slack variable. And this is the data I'm showing you now, I'm gonna update it in a moment, through April of 2021. In April of 2021, the unemployment rate, um, and these are z-scores, so I'm showing, I'm transforming these so they have the same means and standard deviations over the roughly two decades prior to the pandemic. So the unemployment rate, the orange series, was roughly at its pre-pandemic average in April. Now, that's an average for a period that included a major financial crisis. So saying that it was at its average meant it was elevated relative to um, the narrow. So if you were looking at the unemployment rate, you would have said, you know, it's as bad as it was, there's as much slack as there was on average in the two decades before the pandemic, and there's a lot of slack. If you were looking at prime age EPOP, you would have thought there was a lot, a lot of slack. Um, but some people in April, and it was a minority, were actually looking at job openings and talking about how high they were, or maybe looking at unemployed for job openings. That was one standard deviation below its previous average. And the quits rate, even in April, was three standard deviations below. By the way, these are the actual numbers for April, so you wouldn't have known these um, in, in April. We're three standard deviations below. So you are getting very conflicting signals depending on which slack variable. I think economists place most of their emphasis on the unemployment rate as a slack variable. I'm just doing a simple exercise. Oh, sorry. And this just extends the data through the present. Um, there's a little bit less of a conflicting signal now, although there's still a decent sized one with the quits rate being four standard deviations below its pre-pandemic value. But now the unemployment rate and measures based on job openings like unemployment per job opening are telling uh, roughly the same story. Well, if we look pre-pandemic and you try to predict core CPI and you take the same Phillips curve reject regression, um, quits does better than any other variable. Unemployed per job opening does uh, the second best, unemployment rate third best, and prime age EPOP um, does the worst. That's based on the experience before. So at the very least, should have been placing almost an equal amount of weight on these variables. If anything, maybe looking more at quits and less at the unemployment rate. Um, second thing uh, missing, you know, maybe our theories, which were really about real, were really about nominal GDP, not real GDP. This was a simple mental model that makes sense of 2021. Use multipliers to predict nominal GDP. Use the productive capacity of the economy to predict real GDP. And then prices are the residual. And as a mental model, this doesn't have a Phillips curve in it because it doesn't force you to deal with the fact that you have no idea what the natural rate is because it's changing so rapidly in 2021 in the way that it isn't normal. Um, so finally, let me end by saying what I expect um, going forward. Um, I expect inflation to remain very elevated in 2022. And in part, I think this is because I'm taking mostly our existing theory seriously. I think demand will be above trend. Uh, monetary policy is about as accommodative as it's ever been. It matters with a one-year lag. So no matter what the Fed does in March or June, it's still going to be accommodative this year. It's still going to be accommodative next year. Fiscal policy is much less accommodative than it was a year ago, but $525 billion is spending out this year from the American Rescue Plan. Moreover, um, people have been trying to count on a big fiscal crunch to change the dynamics of the economy. Uh, the fiscal crunch happened after April. We are now seven months past the dramatic downsizing of fiscal policy and retail sales continues to be gangbusters. Um, this excess saving from a year and a half of consumption below trend and income above trend, and I hope the pandemic comes under control, and we get used to it. I think if that happens, that will be a positive for inflation, not a negative per my previous. I think supply will be below trend. Um, it will improve, but there'll be some lingering impacts of the pandemic and hysteresis. And so to me, that's the core case for higher inflation. Um, labor markets will be tight. Um, quits are four st standard deviations above pre-pandemic range. We could even see the unemployment rate falling below three and a half percent. We've just started to see the consequences of that, for example, in today's wage numbers. Um, we're going to have a shift from goods to services inflation. Um, just a one percentage point increase in services inflation is enough to offset five percentage point decrease in goods. Inflation expectations are higher for consumers, forecasters, businesses, and markets. 
Finally, wage price pass through. It's the one I'm actually least certain about because there's been a big productivity increase, there's big profit margins, not positive it'll happen. Um, and I'll end by putting my own uh, highly, highly, highly subjective probability distribution for 2022 core PCE um, down on the table. Um, the modal outcome is in the three to four range. The mean is 3.2. But I do think if there's any lesson any of us should take from this past year, from last year, is that we should be really humble. So below one and above uh, five are both um, distinctive possibilities. I should say this compares to a forecast of 2.1 by the Fed staff. So it's rather different than the Fed seems to be counting on. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So next up we have Joe Gagnon and I'm going to, uh, we'll get those slides up. Okay, thanks Josh. Um, and uh, you can move right to the next slide, please. Okay. So uh, my talk today is gonna be based on uh, some research I've been doing with Kristen Forbes at MIT. Oops. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and Kristen Forbes at MIT and Chris Collins, who used to work uh, with me at Peterson. He's now at Morgan Stanley. Uh, we posted uh, an article on voxeu.org, uh, which you can see here, which is I uh, got most of these ideas. But this is based on um, uh, research we did in the working paper there at the bottom, Forbes, Canyon, and Collins. Um, and I'm also going to draw on uh, an earlier paper I, I wrote with Chris that you can also see there. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, so we know that um, you know, many central banks, governments, agencies, and private forecasters use the Phillips curve to model inflation and to help forecast inflation. So I thought it'd be useful to take us back to the original Phillips curve. Uh, and this was back uh, from his 1958 article, although it was based on data even earlier from the, the gold standard period, a period in which average inflation was very low. And what's striking about this uh, curve is how non-linear it is. Uh, with a low unemployment, the curve is nearly vertical. With high unemployment, the curve is nearly horizontal. It's, quite, it's basically a hyperbola. It's extremely non-linear, but most models that are in use today are linear. Uh, so Chris and I, in that first working paper, uh, decided to look at the US and see whether there was evidence for a nonlinear curve going back. And what we found is that when inflation was low back in the 50s and 60s, we found a nonlinear curve. But then as inflation rose in the 70s and 80s, high in the 70s and 80s, we found a linear curve. And then since about the mid 90s, when inflation's back to being very low, we get a nonlinear curve. Uh, so um, then, we, we argue that low inflation actually bends the curve and makes it nonlinear. So next slide, please. So uh, we believe that the reason for this is downward wage and price rigidity. Um, and uh, there is sort of lots of evidence for this in, in many countries, uh, especially when it comes to wages. Uh, but I would argue that it, it's also true somewhat but for at least some prices uh, you know, my barber has never cut the price of a haircut in my entire life. I've never seen that happen. And I'm sure there are other services like that where that's true. Uh, and also, you know, even in, in other areas like uh, goods production, you know, a wage rigidity probably has some effect on price rigidity. Um, we have a model here that's based on wages. Uh, and the key insight that matters is, the, is that uh, not all workers get the same wage increase and not all goods have the same price increase. So when inflation averages 10%, as you see in the green line at the top, the dotted green line at the top, some workers are getting more than 10% wage increases. Some workers are getting less than 10% wage increases and the average is 10. Uh, and when uh, that's the case, the curve is, is, is nice and linear. But as this expected inflation environment falls down towards zero, you get more and more workers uh, and firms you know, facing potential negative uh, price changes, which they resist strongly. Uh, you, know, it's, you just see this in the data. There's a huge truncation at zero. People really don't like wage cuts and they'd rather be unemployed or they at least uh, act that way. Uh, this basically bends the curve, uh, as you can see, 
to being flatter for higher rates of unemployment. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, we think that since we've moved to low, very low uh, inflation around the advanced economies, we've often been to the right here where the Phillips curve is flat and people have noticed that in, in, in research. And it makes it hard to estimate what the natural rate really is because changes in unemployment have very little effect on inflation. So I think this is um, gonna be a topic of my next paper is, is what, what that means for macroeconomics. Um, but uh, next slide, please. Uh, what uh, Kristen and Chris and I did was apply this uh, to 31 other countries, mostly advanced economies. Uh, and we also got the same results that we got for the US, that when inflation is low, uh, and for us it's, it's when lagged inflation is, is less than about 3%, we find a nonlinear curve that you see on the left uh, where high rates of slack uh, have very little effect on inflation. But when inflation is high, which is the panel on the right, when it's uh, lagged inflation has been above 3%, then you get a standard uh, linear Phillips curve in which slack does put down the pressure on inflation. Uh, these results are not sensitive to uh, reasonable changes in that threshold, whether it be 2% or 4%, uh, it doesn't really make much difference. Uh, so I would note that the regressions behind this, uh, these results include sort of the standard controls that are in typical Phillips curve models. We, have uh, measures of long run inflation expectations and dynamic adjustment. We also have uh, the more flexible price effects coming through commodity prices, uh, imports, exchange rates. And we also find a global effects through global slack. This has uh, been Christian's focus in the past, which seem to be important. And so these global factors seem to operate, especially to the more flexible prices, uh, but they are important. But controlling for all these things doesn't change the, the fact that the Phillips curve is there. Uh, and it's just affected by the level of inflation, uh, as you see here. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the inflation we've seen in the pandemic? Uh, well, uh, in the uh, initial phase of the pandemic in 2020, the economy shut down around the world, uh, and this put uh, severe downward pressure on all commodity prices around the world. This is a global phenomenon. And that led to most of the decline in inflation that you see there. Other prices basically didn't change too much uh, with the exception of some energy intensive services like uh, transportation. Um, then as we learned to live with COVID uh, and sort of people went back to work and demand sort of bounced back, uh, I would argue that demand actually came back more than supply. I, and I guess this is, uh, I'm agreeing with what uh, Jason was just talking about. Uh, and well, of course, also uh, the increase in output back towards its previous uh, trend uh, caused commodity prices to rebound, which uh, tells, which describes most of the increase in inflation for developing economies. But for advanced economies, we've got even more inflation. And that's, we believe, because we've moved to the steep part of the Phillips curve. We've actually uh, running economies above potential at least the short run potential, as Jason said. Now, and you might say, well, uh, unemployment today only ticked down to 3.9, which is about where it was pre-COVID. We didn't have inflation then. Why do we have inflation now? Well, I think um, as for some of the reasons Jason said and more, I think it's pretty clear that the natural rate of unemployment, and I don't, uh, by the way, I think that other measures, natural rate of unemployment, uh, the uh, unemployment rate isn't a sufficient statistic for inflation. So I agree with Jason, there's other things we should be looking at and, and they each have some power. But wh wherever you look at the natural rate of unemployment, uh, labor supply is definitely, um, natural rate of unemployment is definitely higher now. People are afraid of going to work. Uh, they don't wanna get infected. They um, may have been shut out. Uh, their, their workplaces have been shut down temporarily. Uh, some parents have to stay home because kids are, um, schools are closed. Uh, fiscal aid has helped people to afford to stay out of labor force. For all these reasons, uh, we think that uh, the natural rate on climate now is currently well above four. Uh, it may come back down to around four or so, or even less, um, but it's clearly above four and we're clearly on the steep part of the Phillips curve. Uh, and this is causing inflation. I would also add, and this is, uh, I think a separate point, and I, this may be a, a slight difference with what Jason said. I think the demand rotation away from services to goods 
has an additional effect of its own, even aside from the, the aggregate. Uh, because if you had linear Phillips curves, it wouldn't. Uh, the downward effect on services from reduced demand for services would lower prices there as much as the upward uh, demand for goods would raise prices there. But we don't have linear Phillips curves. We have nonlinear Phillips curves. And service prices don't fall much, but goods prices rise a lot. So your prices are much more flexible on the upward side. Therefore, a rotation in, in demand without changing the level of demand is inflationary, uh, even on its own. All right, the final slide. Um, so what does this mean going forward? Well, some people um, you know, see a return to the bad old 1970s. Uh, I think that uh, central banks, I think, are not going to make that mistake again. It took years of central bank uh, inaction and, and, and um, you know, being asleep at the wheel to, to, let, to lead to the 1970s. I don't think that's going to happen. The Fed clearly is signaling it's not going to happen. I think uh, the 1950s is a better uh, uh, analogy. And this chart is actually taken from a blog post I wrote back in February of last year when I uh, argued that there would be a big burst of inflation this year. Um, and for precisely the reasons Jason discussed, I mean, this massive fiscal stimulus using standard macro should raise inflation. And I, I couldn't, for the life of me, understand why no one was seeing that at the time, except for very few people, uh, what we saw. It. Um, and, but the thing is, will it be permanent? Well, it might be to the extent that output stays well above potential. Uh, and that's going to be the key issue we should discuss. Uh, but in the 1950s, it came down very fast. Uh, what happened in 1950 was that South, North Korea invaded South Korea. Uh, the US went immediately into war, started drafting workers and buying goods. And households, remembering the rationing of World War II, uh, rushed to buy goods in, in advance of rationing, which was in fact not imposed. So there was a massive run up of inflation to almost 10% within just a few months, but it fell quickly within 12 months back to 2% and within 12 more months back to 1%. And this did not require a recession or any increase in the unemployment rate. And I think the key is that people saw this as a temporary thing related to the war. Also, uh, people, taxes were raised in the Korean War that probably the only time in US history where a war was fully financed by tax increases. Uh, and so that helped return uh, demand back to, to normal. So uh, given that people saw that this was just a, temp a unique thing and demand was pulled back in line, uh, inflation quickly fell uh, without causing recession. I think that could happen again if people think that COVID is a temporary phenomenon and that the COVID uh, pandemic and the reaction to it uh, cause this inflation, but that that won't continue, we could get back to something normal. Um, and I think we could get, if we get a rotation of demand back towards services away from goods uh, and workers are willing to go back to work to increase supply, supply could catch up with demand and, and we could get a rapid drop in price pressures, especially in goods. However, there's some uh, advanced signals that rents are about to rise, starting to rise. So that will go the other way. I, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen in 2022, but I think that a year from now when all the dust is settled, I'm kind of with Jason. I think inflation is going to be lower than the 6% we just saw. But given that demand is likely to still be very strong and slightly ahead of supply capacity, I think inflation is still going to be well above the Fed's target of two. And something like 3% is, I think, certainly quite plausible. Um, if that's the case, my final point would be the Fed should really be raising the inflation target anyway. And that could be in 2023, an ideal moment to do that, if that all pans out this way. Because if anything we've learned from the past 20 years is that 2% is too low of an inflation target anyway. Uh, it's too close to the zero bound for interest rates and for uh, wage and price behavior. And I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have uh, John. Okay, thanks for having me. Um, so, uh, as we've as we've been discussing, um, inflation rose quite substantially in 2020. Um, now, 
I, um, I like to think about this uh, through the lens of the Phillips curve. And so here on this slide, I've uh, you know, written down a fairly standard formulation of the Phillips curve where inflation is a function of expected future inflation, the output gap and supply shocks. Now, um, a downside of this standard formulation is that the inflationary expectations term here is, is very directly related to the current state of the economy because this is, infl this is current expectations about uh, inflation next period. Okay, so if there's a boom today, there's likely to be a boom six months from now. So um, current expectations about inflation six months from now are, are affected by that current boom. So I think it's useful to, uh, to get, a, get away from this kind of, in, you know, direct connection between these two terms to manipulate this, this Phillips curve a bit and arrive at a different um, uh, formulation of the same equation, which, which looks like this, the second formulation here. So here, the key difference is that uh, what's on the uh, right-hand side is a longer inflation expectations. So we have longer inflation expectations, uh, the current, you know, some measure of demand like the unemployment rate and supply shocks. And so in this case, you know, longer inflation expectations are not directly uh, affected by the current uh, state of the economy. They're more, uh, more determined by long run expectations about monetary policy. Okay, so we have kind of three somewhat independent factors that are driving inflation in this formulation. Okay, so uh, before I get back to, um, before I get back to uh, what happened in 2020, let me just briefly give kind of a, a, a history of inflation over the last 50 years. So the history of inflation over the last 50 years can basically be divided into two almost equally long bits. There's the first part where inflation was very volatile in the 70s and 80s, and then inflation became very stable in the 90s uh, and 2000s. Um, and, you know, this very sharp contrast between the experience of inflation in the 70s and 80s on the one hand and the experience of inflation since then has very often led to a narrative that there's something fundamental that has changed about the Phillips curve over this period, that maybe the Phillips curve was steep in the 1970s and 80s um, and then uh, became much flatter uh, in the subsequent 25, 30 years. Okay, so it's, it's kind of interesting, we're so caught up in, in the fact that inflation has been high and volatile in 20, 2021 that, you know, one sometimes forget, it's easy to forget the fact that the debate for the last 25 years before that was about missing inflation and missing disinflation. Um, and, and so now we might, you know, go back to debating how the Phillips curve has changed again, or it's nonlinear or so on. Now, I think that, um, I think that to some extent, this debate is so, somewhat flawed. And, and the reason for that is that I think that this debate often does not uh, recognize enough the crucial role of the other two determinants of inflation apart from uh, demand, apart from the output gap, you know, um, inflationary expectations and supply shocks. Um, it's true that one way to tell the story about what happened over the last 50 years is that this coefficient on uh, the unemployment rate, for example, may have been high early on and then smaller uh, in, in the more recent period. And that's one way to think about why inflation was so tame for those 30 years. But another way to think about why inflation was so tame over those 30 years was that the volatility of these other two components may have fallen quite substantially. So inflation expectations may have become much more anchored and we may just have hit uh, a few decades where there were less supply shocks than in earlier decades, okay? Now, as it turns out, it's very hard to tell the difference between these two stories using aggregate data, it's almost impossible. And so the empirical literature, a branch at least of the empirical literature on the Phillips curve in recent years has turned towards trying to use regional data to tell these, tell these stories apart. And in some work that I've done recently with co-authors, we've tried to do exactly this, we've tried to tell apart these two stories. And you know, one part of doing that is, is estimating the slope of the Phillips curve in the two subperiods, in the early period and in the later period. And when we do that, we actually find that the, the, our estimates are not that different. So we kind of reject the idea that 
that there's some radical change to the Phillips curve, that, that the Phillips curve became much more flat. And, and, and our results suggest that what really happened was that these other two terms, inflation expectations and supply shocks, became much less volatile. That in particular, inflation expectations became much more anchored. And that's why um, inflation has been so stable between 1990 and, and 2020. Okay, so with that kind of brief history, let me get back to what happened in 2021. And I wanna think about it through the lens of you know, these three components here, inflation expectations, demand, and supply. And let's start with inflation expectations. So these are long run inflation expectations. Now they did rise modestly over the course of 2021. So here I'm showing you long run inflation expectations, three measures of it. And you can see there's a tick up in inflation expectations during 2021. But you know, the size of this is fairly modest. You know, we're going from maybe 2% to 3%. So this is not explaining a very large fraction of what happened to inflation over 2021. So what we're left with is demand and supply. Okay, so the, the simplest way to tell you know, a demand-driven story is to look at kind of a conventional measure of demand, like the unemployment rate. Um, and and, and you know, it's true that the unemployment rate right now is very low in his, you know, from a historical point of view. But at the same time, the unemployment rate is actually, it's actually higher than it was pre-COVID. It's not lower than it was pre-COVID. So, um, so you know, that simple, that simplest of demand stories doesn't explain why inflation is so much higher today uh, than it was pre-COVID. Okay, so you need something more. Okay, now you know, and here I kind of differ a little bit from the narrative that Jason gave, in that I think that a important part of the story uh, on the demand side is this shift from uh, demand for services to demand for goods during COVID. That shift is very large. Jason showed you the, the picture earlier in the, in the panel. And, and I think that actually does play an important role in what's going on. So, um, you know, so you know, one formalization of that is, is in a recent paper by Guerreri, Lorenzoni, uh, Straub and Werning uh, that was given at Jackson Hole earlier this year. That's in a model where you have downward uh, downward wage rigidity. And so uh, you create a lot of demand in one sector and that creates inflation in that sector, but the other sector doesn't have offsetting, you know, fall in inflation in that kind of a model. Um, you can also think about ideas going back to Ball and Mankiw that, that are similar in that sense. And so I think that it does make sense to think of the extreme um, uh, tightness in the goods producing part of the economy as having played a role in generating aggregate inflation over the course of 2021. But the other thing that I think played a big role is supply shocks. Supply shocks are back um, in a big way. Um, and the most important you know, supply shock in my mind during 2021, there was some semiconductor stuff early in the year, and maybe that's still playing a role. Um, but you know, the most important thing is that, that a lot of workers left the labor force. Uh, due to COVID during 2021, it's you know this is not a small thing, um, and um, and that is really holding back the productive capacity of the economy and uh, contributing to the to the imbalance between demand and supply um, in the economy at the moment. Okay, so 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 that brings me to the question of of what the Fed should do about this in the coming year. Okay, so when you try to contemplate that question, of course, much depends on what you think is gonna to happen to inflation over the course of 2022. Uh, last time the survey of professional forecasters was put out, uh, the inflation forecast uh, in, in that survey for 2022 for C the core CPI was 2.6%. So they're forecasting a very sharp moderation of inflation in 2022. I have to say that I think this is a, is a very optimistic forecast, much too optimistic. Um, you know, it's true that some of the things that have led to inflation may moderate in 2022, but I, I you know, I agree with my fellow panelists that this, the demand and supply imbalance is likely to continue in 2022. And then the fact that we've already seen so much inflation in 2021 is going to lead to, and we're, we're already starting to see that, uh, increased wages and increased wage demands, and that's going to put further pressure on costs and going to contribute to inflation in 2022. So, 
I'm not at all as optimistic about inflation as the survey of professional forecasters was last time they were surveyed. Uh, I think it's much more likely that we're going to see inflation in the 3.5 to 4.5 uh, uh, region in 2022. And actually, I think there's substantial upside risk on, on that forecast. I would put even more than five, 7% on, on the above 5% uh, for the PCE that uh, Jason had. So, so I'm kind of worried about what's going to happen about inflation in 2022. So given that, um, I think what is currently expected in terms of what the Fed is going to do in 2022 um, is, very, is, is just far too little. So currently, we're expecting the Fed to raise interest rates three times up to a, a level of 1% at the end of 2022. That, you know, given these expectations about inflation, implies real rates over the course of 2022 that are extremely low, below minus 2%. I think that's just way too low uh, in a situation where you have a, a, a demand supply imbalance and when you have inflation being uh, quite elevated relative to target. So what I think the Fed should do is something uh, you know, uh, much more aggressive. I think the Fed should raise the federal funds rate by 25 basis points at each of its meetings this year, uh, so eight times. And I think actually the Fed should continue to raise interest rates at by 25 basis points at each meeting, at least until it gets to the federal funds rate being about two and a half percent. Now that recommendation comes with the obvious um, escape clauses that the Fed should reassess that if the if, if inflation doesn't in, indeed come down more rapidly than I'm expecting, and in particular if the federal funds rate rises above inflation, I think they should uh, they should reassess. Also, if unemployment starts to rise, they should reassess. But on the other hand. Um, they should, you know, inflation doesn't come down in the way that I'm predicting. I think that the Fed should do even more uh, than this. Okay, so putting out this, this particular recommendation, maybe a lot of you are thinking I'm some kind of crazy hawk. And I want to temper that narrative a little bit by saying that um, I actually am very sympathetic to the changes in the Fed's framework that they implemented in 2019, and in particular to the focus on maximum employment. Um, on occasion in the past, past uh, Fed policy has been uh, driven by a worry that the economy has exceeded the Nehru. Um, and, um, and so they've on occasion engaged in preemptive tightening due to that kind of a worry. And I, for a long time, have thought that that was based on relatively weak evidence. I don't think we know what the Nehru is. I think it's quite plausible that the Nehru is very low and that we've actually never reached the Nehru. So I actually think that it does make sense to, to uh, adopt a wait and seek approach uh, when there is no inflation. But the problem is that we're not in that situation anymore. Inflation has arrived. And so uh, we have to think about things differently uh, than before. Now, sometimes you hear the argument that the new framework with the average inflation targeting means that the Fed should wait. You know, I think by now there's been so much inflation that you know that argument doesn't really uh, is not a strong argument anymore. We've we've made up for the shortfalls even over several years uh, by by now and more than that. So so I wouldn't put much weight on that argument at the moment. The thing that I'm wor one thing that I'm worried about about the current debate is that it um, is that there's some kind of a lack of historical perspective going on. We've had extremely low interest rates now for about a decade. And you know, for many people that are working in the markets, this is you know, the better part of their adult life. They've never seen anything but very low interest rates. And so it may seem like an, a very extreme thing to raise interest rates by 2%. Um, and you know, I, I, th I think it's important for people to, to look at a slightly large, longer span of history and recognize that the economy has functioned perfectly well with higher interest rates in the past. And the Fed in the past has raised interest rates much more rapidly than just three times over the course of a single year um, without wrecking the economy. I think it's actually quite dangerous uh, to uh, get into a situation where the Fed is, ex is extremely reluctant to raise interest rates at more than something like three times a year. Um, and the, da the danger is that we shouldn't take the current anchoring of inflationary expectations for granted. That anchoring is predicated on the belief that the Fed will do what it takes to keep inflation low or bring inflation down, even if those actions are costly 
And if the markets and the private sector in general loses confidence in the Fed's willingness to do that, or the political dynamics in the whole country allowing the Fed to do that, then I think we're going to find ourselves back in a similar situation to the late 70s, and that's not a good place to be. So I'm going to leave, leave you with this picture here. What I'm plotting here is core CPI, the research series, that's the black line, and long-run SPF inflation forecasts. Um, and you can see that since 1998, inflation forecasts, uh, sorry, inflation expectations have been extremely stable. They've been anchored. Now, you know, I don't know, they haven't risen very much, but this certainly looks uh, much steeper than anything we've seen since 1998. And it does give me some pause. Um, and, and I certainly hope that uh, we take seriously not to squander the, the, the hard earned anchoring of inflation expectations. Uh, that was achieved in the 1980s. Great, thank you so much to all of you for the those fantastic comments. I think what we'll do is we'll we'll go back through starting again with Jason and and um, I invite you to re respond to the other panelists and let me also just put a couple questions out there which you can you you may uh, comment on if if you want. So one which came in on the Q and A from Yuri Granichenko is all of you are forecasting it, it sounds like inflation in 2022 uh, of something like three or four percent, which is significantly higher than the Fed is forecasting and also higher than uh, inflation expectations from the private sector as as we just saw on uh, on John's slide. So I'd be interested in, in where you think that difference is coming from and if you can perhaps make the case for the, the Fed forecast or, or the, the case that, you know, that inflation will be 2% next year. Is there, is there an argument for that? And, and if there isn't, why, why exactly are, are, do we not see these forecasts coming from the Fed or, or in, in the private sector? Another somewhat related question is, what the role of inflation expectations is here? So this was emphasized a lot by John, and I'm interested in your perspective on how much that matters for determining inflation. Clearly, what happened this year was not the result of higher inflation expectations. I think sometimes people are reassured about inflation going forward by the fact that expectations are not that high. I wonder how reassuring we should take that. Um, and if inflation expectations do matter, I always wonder whose expectations matter. So a, a fact that's always stuck with me is that in Japan, you ask consumers and consumers always expect 4% inflation in Japan. Clearly inflation in Japan is, it has not been 4% since the 1980s. Those expectations do not in any way seem to drive inflation or seem to necessarily be correspond to reality all that much. But is it, so is it businesses? Is it financial markets? Sort of what is the mechanism there? Or is that actually not a variable we should be focusing on a lot? Okay, so let me let me turn it over to, to Jason. Great. Um, so I'll touch on some of that, and I may miss some of that, which is probably fine too. Um, John and my inflation forecasts are actually relatively closer than they look, because um, I gave you poor core PCE. Um, core CPI, which he showed you, has a much larger weight for shelter. Shelter will, with complete certainty, be near complete certainty, be growing much faster in 2022 than it was in 2021. And so my core CPI forecast would be more like 3738 um, for the year. And both John and I, and Joe didn't put out a number, but I think if he did, I, um, Yuri's correct, are way above um, the, the market and others. Um, you know, one thing to say is, you know, the market and other forecasters have a large standard error around it. I mean, I showed you the market thought it was gonna be two seven this year. Uh, they missed by five percentage points. Um, and by the way, you can look at their forecast from, you know, as late as May or June, and they missed by many, many percentage points. So it's not like they know the truth. Um, on average, though, I would go with people that have billions of dollars at stake over, you know, even John and Joe. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I gave a talk in February where I showed the exact same fiscal analysis that I showed here. And I said, I cannot for the life of me see how we won't have crazy inflation this year because it's so much bigger than the output gap. But no one who I trust and respect thinks we're gonna have crazy inflation. And so my view of inflation is 20% what I would think if locked in a room by myself and 80% what everyone else thinks. And I should say that's pretty arrogant to give even 20% weight to your own views on any topic. Um, 
I don't know. After this year, I confess I'm like up from 20% weight on my own views to something a little bit um, higher than that. And now, and there's people like John out there too. Um, so I can include them in the other part. So I think people are still not taking our theory seriously enough. They're still not looking. You know, 525 billion of fiscal policies here. That's like 3% of GDP. That's as much as we did in 2010. That is a huge fiscal stimulus um, we're doing this year. There's been a lot of wishful thinking this past year of the form of if everything that's growing above normal goes back to normal and everything else stays the same, then price growth will be lower. Um, we might have agreed more than Joe and John admitted on the good services rotation. I think it's been a factor. I just think it's not one for one. You can't just assume the goods goes away and the services doesn't change. Um, by the way, I think the nonlinear argument you made, Joe, and the Gyari, Werning, et cetera, one from Jackson Hole, doesn't apply that much when service inflation was running at four and a half percent and wages were rising quite a lot. So I don't think downward rigidity mattered a lot um, in the service sector, which is part of what was motivating what both of you said. Um, I don't love arguments around inflation expectations. I feel like they're the residual. Um, I think they're really important, but in terms of trying to predict them, I have no idea how to predict them. So you saw people on both sides of the debate. You thought inflation was under control, it's because they're anchored. If you thought it was not under control, it's gonna be to become de-anchored. I don't know whose inflation expectations matter. I don't know whether they stay anchored or not, which is why I try to look more at things like supply and demand, which I know how to look at and understand a little bit more than expectations. And um, I guess the last thing I'd say, my commentary on Joe and John, I think you both had too much unemployment rate, not enough measures of other slack and didn't take into account, and I'm gonna make the biggest mistake one can make on a panel um, with John, which is to mention Iceland, you know, for the 20 years before the financial crisis, uh, before the COVID crisis, Japan had 0% inflation, Iceland had 5% inflation. That wasn't because slack was higher in Japan than Iceland. You can have very, very different inflation rates with the same um, amount of slack. So I don't think we wanna have too slack centric an explanation of all inflation differences either over time and certainly not across countries. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't give a number forecast, but uh, I, I would align myself very much with Jason's numbers. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, we're, we're pretty much in line. I, to me, the the interesting thing is the dynamics of getting there, because I think, I think if if we did have uh, some return to normalcy, if if Omicron wave ends up sort of breaking the back of of the pandemic in some sense so that everyone's infected and it's mild and then we just move forward uh, to something that's that's we just live with it then people will come back i think into the labor force and people might rotate their demand back away from goods and if anything if they there might be some readjustment in the other direction where goods uh, demand actually gets temporarily weaker you could have a, a significantly sharp fall in some goods prices uh, and that may mask the underlying true inflationary pressures. I'm totally with Jason that rents are going to rise. So uh, I think more in terms of when the dust is settled, you know, a year from now, where will we be? And that's where I think uh, we might go below three for a while uh, in this year, especially if you look at less than 12 month, you know, measures. But once the dust is settled and everything, I think the trend will be uh, well above two because the economy is just going to be continuously strong throughout. Uh, and so that's where I agree with Jason. Sort of when the dust is settled, we'll be at probably around 3% inflation. Um, uh, I guess uh, the question you asked about, you know, is so is, is there a case for the Fed forecast? Um, basically, I guess it would be if they think that this goods readjustment could have some actual negative inflation in certain goods categories that could support that forecast. But as I just said, you know, there are things going on and I don't think that's where we're gonna end up. Um, then uh, I, I, talking about, you know, people who have money at stake or, you know, how come they're not seeing this inflation and why, why aren't long run expectations rising very much in the bond market, uh, they have risen some, but you know, they were, they're still, the level is very low. They were, they were lower than could be explained not that long ago and they've come up, yes, as John said, but they're not at high levels historically at all. Well, 
you know, when I've looked at bond markets, I have a few blog posts on this earlier this year, bond markets have never predicted an outburst of inflation. So why would we think now suddenly they can't? They never have. You know, I defy anyone to find a major burst of inflation that the bond market predicted before it happened. They respond very quickly when inflation starts to rise. They have never predicted it. So I put zero weight on the bond market. I have to say I put more weight on what professional forecasters say. And I was calling professional forecasters last February and March and asking, what the hell are you thinking? We just had the biggest fiscal package in modern history since World War II, and you're not forecasting a massive spurt of nominal GDP growth. Uh, and I heard all kinds of reasons, you know, people aren't gonna spend the money, blah, blah, blah. It, it just, it never made sense with me. Um, so I don't know what to say about that. Um, uh, like Jason, I am revising up how much I trust my own instincts and revising down, I, I listen to other experts. <laughs> Maybe that'll get me to trouble someday, but I don't know. Um, I think on the, Jason raised a little point about the service sector. Um, yeah, I mean, the service sector has had, there, within the service sector, very different things going on. There's actually been uh, growing demand for housing, uh, but, you know, restaurants have been hurt. But I think it's pretty clear that uh, the, because, uh, the, the, because people don't want, the labor supply has, has, has shrunk a lot compared to demand, wages have gone up. And this is why you don't see falling prices in the service sector. But I think my point is still valid. I mean, there's many things going on, but if you had a rotation and it was the only thing going on, a rotation of demand towards goods and away from services, I would argue that that would be by itself inflationary, even if the total spending didn't change because I would argue that you wouldn't see nearly as much price declines in the services that you would get in goods. And I think that's going on underneath all these other things that are going on and hard to measure. I'll stop there. Thank you, John. Yeah, so you, you asked us about, you know, to justify the fact that we're uh, expecting something more than the professional forecasters. So I think when I think about that, um, one thing is that there's, you know, COVID is a very unusual event. So like, you know, the fact that the professional forecasters have these models, you know, that makes them much better than, you know, us in, in normal times. But, you know, we're facing very unusual events that are large. And so I think there's more judgment in what's going on right now than maybe in normal times. So in particular, this fall in the labor force participation that, that happened during COVID. So, you know, this is like not something very normal, you know? So how can they, you know, do they know any better than I do? Like what's gonna happen with that? I'm not so sure. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not saying I know what's gonna happen, but, but, you know, I think it's probably gonna be pretty persistent. Um, now, in, that brings me to a more general feature, which is a critique of the, modeling that is done by professional forecasters. Now, in general, I think professional forecasters are pretty good at what they do, but in terms of GDP forecasts, um, I think they have a tendency to view the world as being more trend stationary than it actually is. Um, and so I think at the moment that may be playing a role. Now, it turns out that COVID is maybe the most trend stationary recession we've ever seen but I'm not so sure that that's gonna continue going forward. And in particular, when it comes to this labor force participation part, I'm not so sure that's translationary, that might be permanent. Um, and that's playing some role in, in my view that the that supply is gonna be below demand in kind of a substantial way uh, in 2022. Uh, Jason um, mentioned about, you know, the role of inflationary expectations in one's forecasts. And, you know, I'm, I agree with him on that. That if you're, if you're just trying to forecast the next year, it's true, inflationary expectations are hard to predict and you, you shouldn't probably put very much weight on them. But that still doesn't mean that as a policymaker, when you're really thinking about what's going on over the next five, 10 years and making sure that you don't lose control of the situation, that they shouldn't, inflationary expectations shouldn't be you know, front and center in, in how you're thinking about things. You know, the Fed needs to, 
convey something about its reaction function. And currently we all still believe that its reaction function is such that it's gonna do whatever it takes. But you know, that's what I'm talking about. You know, they better not screw that up and, and let us doubt that that is the case. Um, and you know, so it's gonna be very unpredictable if and when inflation expectations take off. And I'm not saying we should try to forecast that, but we should be very worried about that happening. Uh, the third point I wanted to make is coming back to one of the things that Joe said in his initial talk, and that was about raising the inflation target. Now, I've actually been quite sympathetic to the notion of raising the inflation target for a long time, but I have to admit that the experience of the last you know, 18 months or so has, or 12 months, has given me some pause uh, on that front. First of all, it's just kind of shocking to some of us economists how, how much people hate inflation. Um, and second of all, you know, there's this line that you sometimes hear, you know, it's sometimes attributed to Greenspan, that inflation should be low enough that nobody's thinking about it. Um, and I, I have to admit that that line has been you know, coming up in my mind more and more uh, in the last, so I don't disagree with the notion that it would be wonderful to have a higher inflation target in terms of not hitting the zero lower bound, in terms of greasing the wheels of the labor market and so on. Those are important benefits of increasing the inflation target. Um, and you know, I have work that kind of uh, argues that some of the costs people talk about in terms of inflation are less than they really should be, but you know, on the other hand, people do hate it, and uh, the political costs of, of having inflation around when, when inflation is so hated are significant. And, and, and so I'm, I'm actually you know, not as sympathetic to raising the inflation target as it was a year ago. Can I just say briefly on the inflation target? Um, I, you know, I'd say two years ago, I'd sort of casually say, hey, it should be 4% for all the zero lower bound gracing the wheels um, arguments. Definitely like John, the last six months, I always sort of knew people disliked inflation more than economists disliked um, inflation, but it's just been visceral. Um, I still think though that, you know, coming out of this, let's say inflation two years from now is 2.8%, changing the framework to be two to three. Maybe you don't even fully admit you've changed the target. You know, maybe that creeps itself to three because inflation, by the way, may be unpopular. But if we're stuck at 2.8% inflation, getting rid of that and the amount of pain and suffering you'd need to get that inflation down back to 2% uh, would also be quite unpopular too. So, um, but I agree the sort of cavalier, like why not have 4% inflation? Um, I sort of feel like scolding the younger me who used to say things like that. Uh, all right, so let, may I, uh, I remember, um, Paul Volcker very well, and um, he is widely lauded with slaying inflation and you know conquering inflation. He was just toasted around the world. I mean, he's lionized. He never got inflation below four uh, percent on a core you know trend basis. It was four. That's what he got, and everyone was happy. Um, and then Alan Greenspan decided that no, because he was an economist and he thought four was not close enough to zero, he would go down to two when he got a chance and he did. But no one, I mean, aside from a very few, um, a very few people in Congress wanted that. It was, and it, didn't, it never went anywhere. Uh, and it was just Greenspan on his own doing that. So there was no public upwelling of support for that. So if we could somehow get back to that, where everyone was happy, inflation was conquered and it was four, we would be in such better place. But I grant you that the politics of getting there now from where we are is horrible. I think Jason puts it probably best if we wound up at three after all this, a few years down the road, and if we are faced with causing a big recession to get back to two, Maybe that's when we could do it. That's what I have in mind. Uh, anyway, as a hope. So I, I wanted to, to come back to what seemed to me like perhaps a, a tension between uh, 
Joe and Jason, and I'd like to hear John's view on this as, as well, as to the effect of COVID on inflation. So I, I got the message from you, Jason, that you see the pandemic is actually disinflationary, whereas I, I, I was hearing from you, Joe, that, that you were thinking if the pandemic disappeared, that would actually help bring inflation down. So to, to be clear, the, the question I, I'd be interested in answers from all of you about is suppose that tomorrow one can wave an amazing magic wand and just pandemic and pandemic related disruptions disappeared. Would that be something that would lead you to think inflation was going to be higher over the next year? Or would that lead you to think inflation was going to be lower over the next year? You're, you're muted, I think. I already said higher. I said that without great confidence because things go in both directions, but you know, a lot more travel, a lot higher oil prices, hotel, airline, restaurant, um, and yes, there'd be some easing off on goods, but not even necessarily that much because with more people you know, in jobs and earning money, they could also buy more goods. So I think the end of the pandemic will be inflationary as we saw in the first half of this year. And you know, what's my biggest evidence for that? Look at 2020. Um, we had a big pandemic and it dramatically reduced uh, inflation. And what about the labor force? So that so that that's always where I feel like the the pandemic is is raising inflation. That you know people are scared to go back to work, or you know, people are are people staying going home. back to work. Or supply and demand, they're making more money and can spend more money, and they're producing more. So I don't know how that nets out for inflation in a world of unemployment insurance with a hundred percent replacement rate that helped inflation. In a world of unemployment we have now, uh, I don't know what direction that goes. Normally we think higher employment is more inflation, not less. So that's like the standard first place to start is if employment improves, inflation goes up, and then you can tell more complicated things that go other directions. Well, okay, so here's, I would think the case is, um, if, if we are, if the Nehru falls uh, because uh, people are willing to go back to work and they weren't before. Uh, you know, we normally think that a falling Nehru is deflationary. So um, I, I think that that would be at work. And I think it maybe partly depends on the extent to which people um, are spending out of savings. There's a big bulge in savings right now. Maybe that can continue. Uh, uh, and if they got back to work, they wouldn't spend all that extra income, Jason. I don't know. I mean, uh, it's tough, but I, I don't know. I, I think of it from a Phillips curve perspective. I think that the Nehru may be elevated because of COVID. And if we got rid of COVID, the Nehru would fall. And I don't think we're gonna get any more macro policy that would be stimulative to demand. So given that there's no macro policy increasing demand, uh, if anything, uh, less as COVID recedes, but we might get on the supply side more uh, uh, following Nehru. I guess I have to think that the, the net effect of all that is, is disinflationary. Do you want to weigh in, John? Yeah, I mean, I'm deeply uncertain about that. I, I kind of agree with Jason on the demand side that, that getting rid of COVID would lead to more spending, but um, you know, this, this very large fall in the labor force, um, whether that would be reversed by, um, by the pandemic ending, that's an, you know, anybody's guess. I'm kind of skeptical that it would actually. My kind of guess is that people kind of got, got to try something that they've never tried before and a lot of them liked it. And, and we're, you know, there's some permanence to, to what happened. And then that would mean it would be inflationary, I guess, because there would be more demand and not as much increase in supply. Oh, I would add also just uh, on top of the Nehru and the demand thing, I, still, I think the rotation thing, if, it wrote, if demand rotates back to services, and, and I agree with Jason that, that ending the COVID would definitely increase demand for airlines and restaurants, but frankly, demand has bounced back a, already an amazing amount for those things, surprisingly so. So I'm not sure how much more we'd get. Uh, and if people, are sated with goods purchases, you'll get a re-rotation back. And I think it's going to be easier for those goods prices to fall uh, going forward, which, uh, you know, I think, you know, we do have downward rigidities, it's true, but when the price of your product has gone up so much in such a short time, you probably are going to be willing to take a price cut uh, in, that, in that circumstance going forward. 
So, uh, and I think uh, Bal and Nenkyu uh, talked about the Korean War as an example of that. In the Korean War, uh, almost all the inflation in the Korean War was in goods prices, and then almost all the disinflation was in goods prices. Uh, and maybe that's what we're about to see. Thank you. Yeah, there's some evidence from uh, Stock and Watson that service prices are more sensitive to slack than goods prices are, and slack matters with sort of a lag of about a year. And so where we are in the labor markets right now, we've only just started to see the conventional, you know, Phillips curve pass through to the service sector. So thank you. Another question, this came in from Francois Gurio, and it's a question I had as well, is you, you hear rhetoric from the administration and others on the role of market power in inflation and even some some talk about price controls or at least antitrust enforcement as an anti-inflationary tool of course economists generally are are not a fan of that is there is there anything to that notion of you know antitrust as a way of fighting inflation or price controls in some selected sectors or is that really an idea that we we hope uh, disappears We're all going to give the same answer, so John, you go first. Well, I was going to say that I think our profession is too negative on price controls in general. Uh, you know, we always teach the perfect markets model. Now, at least in the labor market part of the class, we're starting to teach monopsony. And so, you know, I, I think the standard thing is a bit too knee-jerk. Um, even so, I have not seen a compelling uh kind of uh analysis uh, that we should do very much in terms of price controls I, I mean i think antitrust is always a good thing if 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 we have a lot of monopoly power it's not clear to me that monopoly power has changed dramatically in the last 18 months even though there may be a trend over longer periods but um you know i'm actually kind of you know, sympathetic to at least debating these price controls. Um, so I have more of an open mind, I think, than the median economist. Well, I'll go more reverse mind than me. Um, I mean, look, I think we have a competition problem in our economy. I think we have too lax antitrust enforcement. And so if this is sort of uh, not the world's best reason to do good policies, you know, that's mostly fine with me and I will try not to fly spec um, the motivation for something if I think the ultimate result is a good one. So I do think the tilt towards more competition, the president put out an executive order on increasing competition in mid-2021, 20, uh, didn't link it to inflation, I don't think, at the time. And I thought it was a terrific executive order. And insofar as they're following through on that, that's great. And I'm excited um, to see it. I think it is important, though, that people be reminded of a few things. Um, for example, profit rates are up right now. Well, even if you had perfect competition, if in the short run, all firms are price takers and you have an increase in demand, you're not gonna have entry in the short run and you're gonna have profits um, go up. And moreover, you add in if wages are stickier than prices, um, you might also have profits go up. And that, by the way, might be one reason why you don't like unexpected inflation if you care about um, workers. So, um, and then monopolies have high prices. They don't necessarily have larger rises in prices. So if the Fed believed this theory, I'd be very worried, um, but the Fed doesn't believe this theory. And so, you know, I think it's sort of maybe an interesting conversation. John, maybe it's not an interesting conversation. Maybe it's a bad reason to do a good thing, um, but mostly it's gonna be irrelevant argument on Twitter. Uh, and at I the would, AA meetings. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, entirely for more aggressive antitrust enforcement. Absolutely. I think competition is a, has, has been going down in America, and I think that's a problem. But um, I don't view that. I don't think that's the, at all in the time dimension that matters for the inflation we're talking about today. So, uh, and I would absolutely be against price controls. But I have to sort of insert, I saw a fascinating uh, uh, not quite survey, but it was a um, focus group assessment of, of what messages people liked and disliked that the Biden administration could use in its messaging about inflation. I don't know if anyone else saw this. Um, uh, but the, 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 the number one message 
like by leaps and bounds uh, was we're going to fight inflation by bringing jobs back to America and making things in America again. <laughs> I had to say, well, uh, even though I'm actually been a, one of the few economists who cares about the trade deficit, that's not that's not something I would ever raise in the context of our inflation discussion. But it was by far the most uh, favored uh, Biden administration response to inflation. Interesting. So speaking of, of public reactions to inflation, it's something that, that came up earlier is how much the public dislikes inflation. And something I wonder about is how much of that is also reflecting now that inflation has been accompanied by by shortages. I, I, I just, you know, you, you, you see that around certainly in my daily life, I've been very struck of how much sort of the experience of the economy as a consumer seems to be much worse now, at least for me, than it was a couple of years ago. And I'm, I'm wondering sort of if you have anything to say about the economics of that. I mean, another way of asking that is it seems like in some sense inflation has been lower than one might have thought given demand that a lot of firms are not raising their price. A you know, memorable experience for me is my wife and I went to the Honda dealer thinking of buying a minivan. We asked if we can buy a minivan. They essentially literally laugh at us at the notion that there'd, be, you know, that there'd be a minivan that we could buy in the next few months because they were all bought. Everyone that was being delivered had already been purchased and so on. And you wonder, you know, why isn't Honda raising the price for new minivans? And if they were presumably inflation, you know, maybe inflation would, would be even higher. And you know how much of that is also that people are you know they're saying that they dislike inflation, but what they actually dislike is they can't buy things um, because they're actually not there. I, I don't know. Product placement is inappropriate here, but um, I wasn't compensated for telling for telling Josh that um, Chrysler Pacifica makes the best minivans, um, and we bought ours in January of last year. So that's just how incredibly insightful an economist and inflation forecaster. Um, I am. I do think true inflation is higher than measured inflation because there's been a lot of quality deterioration. You wait for longer in a restaurant, or at least prior to Omicron, you don't get the goods you want as soon as you want. Um, but I wouldn't go too far with the shortage uh, narrative when people are spending nearly 10% more in real terms on goods. People are buying way, way more stuff than ever before. They want to buy even more than that. Maybe they want to buy 15% more in a combination of actual price increases in queuing makes that impossible. But, um, you know, we are producing and consuming more, not less. So in, in that sense, and this gets to a question Yuri has uh, posted, you know, I think I, I got in trouble for phrasing it this way. It wasn't the best way to phrase it. Um, but I described inflation as a high class problem that we have in part because we've solved the other problem. We've solved the shortage problem. People are consuming more, and that's part of why we have um, inflation. We don't have deflation. We don't have high unemployment. So I think we have a better problem than the problem we had 10 years ago. But I also think there's a lot, this isn't like a dichotomous choice. Do you have this or do you have deflation? There's a lot of inflation rates between 7% and 0%, um, some of which would have been better. And, and I tend to think supply was inelastic enough that if we'd done less of a response, um, we would have gotten a lot less inflation and only a little bit less output. Yeah, I wonder if, because I had some similar experiences to, to you, Jason, I, you know, trying to buy a large ticket item a year ago, um, basically you had to wait for months and months, or you could buy the highest end model, you know, like with all the bells and whistles you don't want. And that price of that item didn't change, but I never would have bought it. So I, I was forced to buy it and that shows up as zero inflation, even though of course it is inflation because I wouldn't have bought that item uh, if I hadn't been forced to. So I wonder if though, and I don't know if this is good or bad, but I wonder if that kind of behavior uh, is uh, really enforced and, and enabled by uh, the Fed's credibility on inflation uh, the sense that everyone thinks that inflation shouldn't be much above two and will be going back to two and therefore doesn't want to raise prices too much. And if we were in Argentina, that wouldn't happen. Um, but I don't know. Uh, and would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Because on the one hand, inflation would get out of control quickly, but it would also be reversed quickly. I don't know. Any thoughts? Um, do you want to comment at all, John, on, on these, these issues of shortages and, 
why firms aren't raising prices and is it about you know everyone expects that this is very brief and inflation will be low and so you don't raise your price and you would if we were in argentina wait can i just add if before john answers let me add to that just a little bit um uh, this is about the importance of expectations and john you you stress that a lot and and i don't disagree but i do think one thing if you could add to your answer if you would um it seems to me that the losing of, of a inflation anchor takes time. So, you know, would you talk a little bit about that? My, my interpretation of the, the bad old 60s and 70s is that it took uh, at least five years of gradual increases in expected inflation before it finally totally broke loose and started becoming very volatile. So there's sort of a, a transition period from very stable expectations to gradually rising expectations to suddenly unanchored expectations. Um, is that how you see it? I mean, it seems to me the Fed has some time as long as it doesn't, as long as it shows that it's on the case, even if it's behind the curve, if it's actually moving uh, deliberately, that it can, it can prevent us. It, it would take year, in my view, it would take several years of Fed errors to really get us to a bad position, but do you disagree? No, I, I, I don't think, I think that's a pretty reasonable view to have. I mean, I think one way to think about it is kind of the, the you know, the pass through of inflation into these long run inflation expectations. And, and that was close to zero from, from 1998 until fairly recently. Now, it did become slightly non-zero in the, in the kind of five years prior to the change in the framework. And I think that's pro probably one of the reasons why they were thinking about changing the framework. Um, over the last year, it's certainly not zero. Um, and so I agree that, you know, the more time that elapses, um, you know, the higher that derivative is gonna become. Now, you know, that, goes both ways because if it takes a long time for the derivative to rise, it might also take a long time for that derivative to fall. And so it's it could be extremely costly to even allow it to rise very much at all. So, you know, I'm kind of of the view that that we already have very low real interest rates. Um, the quicker we respond to this, you know, raising interest rates by one and a half, two percent, even two and a half percent is, you know, with the escape clause that you stop if inflation starts falling a lot is never going to wreck the recovery. So in my mind, doing this earlier than later has the benefit of, you know, signaling that you're serious and, and potentially not allowing this derivative to rise. Um, and, and that has major benefits because I think it is sluggish, generally speaking. Now, I don't think it's a law of nature that that derivative has to be sluggish. You know, so these kind of phenomena are probably different from, from financial crises, but, but, you know, financial crises are events that like never happen, never happen until they totally happen, you know, and this, it's, it's entirely possible that this could take that form. Um, I don't think that that's the most likely outcome. I think it's more likely that what you're saying is true. And I think that cuts both ways in, in terms of its costs. Um, so anyway, I still, even despite the fact that, that I agree with you on how this might play out, I still think that that, that means we should act kind of more aggressively than, than the Fed is thinking it will, uh, this coming year. Inflation expectations matter a lot. I completely agree with you, John. I think I agree. I think you agree with me on this too. Um, I just think they're not that forecastable over the next year, so I don't try to invoke them very much and think at what's going to happen over the next year or two. Um, if inflation expectations move slowly, that argument cuts both ways. It says it's hard to change them. And so if they drift up above where you want them to be, and I'll bracket where you want them to be, maybe I want them to be at three, maybe you want them to be at two, um, that could be a long, painful process uh, to bring them down, as you've argued, John. Um, you know, part of what Volcker did was just sort of terrify everyone and upset everyone so much that they lowered their inflation expectations. So even if you think they don't move very quickly, uh, that doesn't necessarily provide reassurance. Um, I'm mostly not worried about them becoming de-anchored in a big way. Um, the case for them becoming de-anchored is the framework was a very big change. Um, the rhetoric was a very big change. The three nominees President Biden is talking about for the Fed are considerably more dovish 
probably than most anyone um, that's been on the Fed for a long time, the ones that are rumored. Um, and that fiscal policies have changed a lot too. Um, I tend to think though that all of this was a little bit of one time coming out of the pandemic. I don't think we're gonna spend $5 trillion a year or every other year going forward. Um, I don't think, um, you know, Jay Powell pivoted a lot in December, not all the way to John, but, but uh, all the way to me. Um, and so, you know, I think there hasn't been as much of a change, but, you know, you could look at the last two years and it wouldn't be crazy to say there's been a regime shift. And if anything should cause a change in inflation expectations, it's a regime shift. But um, I think that's probably not the case, but I think part of why it's probably not the case is that the Fed in some ways is moving off the very, very strict absolutist implementation of the framework um, that they've done in their statements since September of last year. September of two years, two years ago. So we have a, a question from Christina Romer, which is about inflation experiences in other countries. So I'd be interested in your perspective on what's going on there, um, what monetary policy um, is happening abroad, should happen abroad. I guess the specific question I have there as well is, is what explains the larger increase in inflation in the US relative to Europe and particularly relative to uh, Japan and, and I believe other places in East Asia. I guess I'd ask you particularly, Jason, too, given that the pandemic has been much more under control in East Asia, if the pandemic is disinflationary, one, one might have thought that, that that would mean you'd actually see more inflation in, in East Asia uh, and, and one is not. I realize there's many other things going on like, like fiscal stimulus. But. Again, I'll, um, this isn't gonna be pretty, but I, I think I'm gonna um, take the risk of sharing my screen um, and showing you a few things which happen to, I could find them most easily from my Twitter feed um, to, to help put some perspective on this. Uh, oh wait, I'm sharing the wrong thing. Um, share, okay, share Safari. So this is the HICP, so Harmonized uh, Price Index for uh, measured on a comparable basis for the United States and the Euro area. Uh, this data is about a month old and you can see they're quite different from um, each other, about a two percentage point difference consistently um, for many months. So it's a decent size difference. I've tried hard to get good comparable measures of fiscal policy in the two areas. Um, Christy, I know you had some in the paper that you did for BPA. Um, if you look at the deficit numbers, they've gone up almost as much in Germany as they have in the United States. But now let's look at um, disposable personal income relative to trend. Um, this is the United States. We see these big increases in disposable personal income relative to trend, accumulating to $1.5 trillion. Now, um, let's look at France. You don't see anything like that in France. Um, now, let's look at Germany. You don't see anything like that. Disposable personal income has been below trend in Germany over um, the last year and a half. So all of that was a long way of saying, I think that the fiscal expansion in the United States was considerably larger than it was in Europe. I think if you then go through the multipliers and think some of that showed up in real activity, but some of that showed up in prices, because you have my mental model of we added more to nominal GDP than they did. We couldn't expand output that much more than they did because we had the same inelastic supply. Maybe we could expand output less than they did because we did a less good job of keeping workers attached to jobs. You don't have the big declines in participation in Europe than you have in the United States. And so more of our excess demand hit less supply and showed up in prices. I'm not positive of that because I'm not positive our fiscal policy was a lot bigger than Europe's. I think it was though, because that's what you see in the disposable personal income numbers. That's what you see in small business support. That's what you see in the state and local. Um, support virtually every category I've been able to look at. It's larger. Um, and there's some weirdness in the aggregate numbers that we could talk about with Germany, for example, pretending that more gets spent than actually does because of its debt break. So I think it's as simple as more fiscal policy, more inflation um, is a big part of it. And then maybe we have more cars and a few other uh, bumps and whistles like that. I could talk a little bit about Japan. Um, 
that uh, so from what I've seen in Japan, there was a significant fiscal package last year, and there's more coming. Uh, and yet, there is like nothing on inflation in Japan. Now, maybe I don't think their fiscal package was. I don't think that household income thing that you saw in the U.S. is is, is true in Japan. But I think it's better than Germany, uh, and I think they've done quite a bit fiscally. And they haven't had COVID very much. I mean, one big difference in Japan is that the labor market really hasn't changed. It's not like you've seen the great resignation and the quit and all the stuff we've seen. People aren't afraid to go to work there. So uh, I think it does support the idea that um, slightly this idea that maybe the COVID is, is, uh, is, is uh, in, could be inflationary, at least in terms of restricting supply more than increasing demand. But I don't know. I mean, I think it's a puzzle to me, uh, given the global factors that you didn't see uh, inflation rise this year in Japan, despite uh, commodity prices and despite ultra loose monetary policy and despite quite a bit of fiscal stimulus. And I think it's a, a real puzzle, uh, you know, to me, what, what's going on in Japan? Why are they so different? Why, why don't the normal, why wouldn't a fiscal expansion with ultra easy monetary policy and a global commodity price recovery um, you know, uh, boost inflation in Japan. To me, this is a, a, a real puzzle. So I'll just jump in there. There's an estimate from Bloomberg, I haven't verified it myself, that one and a half percentage points uh, of in, inflation is one and a half percentage points in Japan lower than it otherwise would have been because of a decline in mobile phone charges. There was a government led effort. I think cell phone plans have gotten you know, the price has fallen by like half because of some government policy and that that itself took a huge amount out of inflation this year and that otherwise you would have seen a read more like two percent um so but well, I, would, I, I have not checked those numbers myself but well that could explain it because i mean two percent would be an increase right there, yes yeah. yes um do you have any thoughts john on international no no i have nothing to add on that <laughs> So related to, to international factors and coming back to what you were saying, Joe, about the, the focus group and what, what, you know, when you ask Americans, they like the idea of reshoring jobs to fight inflation to perhaps defend that idea a little bit. How much of a risk is it for inflation if China loses control of COVID and we see sort of huge lockdowns across China to try to fight Omicron and that that really disrupts production there? Is, is that something that is sort of high up on the list of risk for inflation actually being higher than one might think next year, or is that just not likely to be a huge deal? Well, I think, yeah, it must be. Um, and I don't have a good sense. I mean, I really, because to, to know what, how that would play out, you have to be both an epidemi epidemiologist as well as an insight into the minds of the Chinese policymakers. Um, it, it, it's a fascinating, issue all of its own, you know, how, how the Chinese government is going to move going forward in COVID if we are in a world like with Omicron where it's super, super contagious and everywhere, uh, and yet they're still trying to have COVID zero. It seems a hard thing to do and how they let go or transition uh, is really gonna be, I have no idea what's gonna happen. Um, it, 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 it seems to me that if they insist on massive lockdowns, that could be a huge risk if it means people aren't going to work. Um, and I just don't, I, I don't know. I mean, we certainly rely on them for uh, a lot of input, a lot of goods, you know, so I, I don't know. Um, that strikes me as a, as, a, as a difficult question and a risk. Um, you know, if we rotate demand back away from goods, maybe that minimizes that somewhat, but we're still very reliant on them. So I, I, don't, I don't have a good sense, except to know that they're so important in the world that it must be a significant risk. So another question from Bill English was about speed effects. So to what extent is sort of inflation this year simply because we had such a rapid increase in aggregate demand? And you know, I know that's often sort of not in our models. I, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that because if you look at the, the 1930s in the US, you see this large increase in inflation at the same time as unemployment is you know 15%, but inflation's rising in the mid 1930s. And there's a, a, a paper by Christina Romer sort of arguing that GDP growth actually has an impact on inflation, not just the, the level of the gap. And so is it possible we saw something like that last year and should that make one 
opti more optimistic this year about inflation falling because you know output growth is not going to be as rapid as what we saw this year? Well, for that to make sense, I think it would have to be asymmetric because we, we saw a very rapid rise in unemployment and then a very rapid fall in unemployment. And, um, you know, I don't know which way that would cut. Um, yeah, a lot of, oh, oh, sorry, were you continuing, John? No, I was going to say something. I mean, there's a lot of, oh, sorry. Uh, actually, that in the Phillips curve regressions I, I recently ran, we, we looked at for speed limit effects and they were usually not significant, usually small and not in our final baseline model uh, in the US. Uh, but, you know, there's like occasional hints that they're there. And I wonder if they might be proxying for some of the more interesting fundamental asymmetries. Again, I think the Ball and Mankiw type work, which I'm probably I only was um, learned about recently, but this idea that that skewness in price changes matters might be um, might be that might be picked up in, inappropriately as a speed limit effect when it's really something else. So I think that may be going on. Um, so I, that, that's just a thought. But um, we did have a lot of skewness. I think I'm, I'm trying to get the data to look at it. Uh, I think we had a lot of skewness in inflation. Must have if it was all in goods inflation. And so maybe um, that's what he's getting at. Maybe that's what Bill is, is getting at. But I think it's not technically a speed limit effect because as you say, as John said, it should have worked both ways last year or in the, in the pandemic. I do think the narrowing was much higher in 2021 than it'll be in 2022. I think potential was much lower in 2021 than it will be in 2022. And so that, in some sense, is like a speed limit effect. As time goes on, um, you're getting, you know, you're, you're chasing a target that is improving. Um, I think, Bill, though, part of your argument has the form that you hear of, here's something that elevated inflation in 2021. It won't be as true in 2022. I'm not saying you're saying this, by the way, but some people do. Ergo, inflation will be too. Um, it, it, you know, this is, you could add this to the list of reasons inflation will be lower in 2022 than it was in 2021. Um, I'm nervous. If you look at my probability distribution, I only had about 15% mass on an outcome of core PCE being higher in 2022 than 2021. And that's because I sort of partly buy the rotation story. I partly buy the speed limit story. I partly buy the fiscal policy was temporarily larger story. Um, I partly buy the labor force participation temporarily with withdrawn story. But I can give you five stories for why inflation will be higher in 2022 than it was in 2021. The um, you know, continued lag effect, the pandemic abating, wages passing through, um, the lagged effect of tight labor markets and inflation expectations shifting up. And so the fact that I put 15% weight on higher inflation in 2022 reflects that I'm averaging in the FOMC staff, which seems to place zero chance on it because their average is 2.1. So the odds that inflation is above four and a half this year, they must have very low or else they have something incredibly skewed. So um, if you locked me in a room by myself, I would have almost thought it was like 50-50 whether inflation would go up or down. Everyone smarter than me thinks it'll go down. So I have it going down, just not as much as everyone uh, who's smarter than me. Thanks. I wanted to. Oh, did you oh, want to yeah, say something? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, actually, I wanted to respond to a question in the in the Q and A, if I may, that was directed towards me. So there's a question in the Q and A whether whether I'm not worried about the financial stability implications of a fast steepening of interest rates and what will happen to stocks and bonds. Um, if the Fed were to raise interest rates by, uh, you know, two percent this year, um, so I I think you know there are, there are several parts to my answer on this. I think first of all, it's true, of course, if you raise interest rates, asset prices will come down. It's it's a very different thing to say that that will cause financial instability. Asset prices falling is not necessarily financial instability. Um, it's very true that if the Fed raises interest rates deeply, there are people in the bond market that will not like that. But 
It's not the job of the Federal Reserve to make people in the bond market happy. If you go back to 1994, uh, when the Fed did a fairly rapid increase in interest rates, people in the bond market were very, very unhappy with it. And for years and years afterward, I would talk to people that were in the bond market in those years that were extremely unhappy about that action. Um, but you know, the fact is that the Fed is trying to stabilize the real economy, not the bond market. Um, and so I, I don't think that that's uh, a good argument for, for, not, for not acting. I wonder if I, I could pick up on that. So I, I have been personally sort of surprised by the Fed's actions or, or rather inaction. I, I always teach my undergrads that the Fed sets the real interest rate as a function of unemployment and inflation. And that sort of view of things doesn't seem to make any sense, given that the Fed has a lower real interest rate now than they did nine months ago, even though the unemployment rate is lower and inflation is higher. So that does not, as an empirical model of Fed policy, I, I feel like I should be teaching the undergrads something different. It seems much more like they're they're targeting nominal rates in some way. And it, it actually seems like, picking up on what you said, John, that a model where they're trying to limit volatility in the bond market is in some ways a better model of their actions than one in which they're they're targeting what's going on in inflation and unemployment, at least if you're trying to describe the, the sort of past six months. Uh, may, may, maybe that's too harsh, but I'd be interested in, in sort of your the, the perspective here and also going forward, sort of the what the Fed is planning to do seems like a very mild action relative to what inflation is. And I'd be interested in trying to understand better what, what you think the Fed might be thinking for how a 75 basis point or 100 basis point change in interest rates this year is, is going to reduce inflation to, to 2%. Maybe I should start, Josh, because um, I used to work at the Fed. At, uh, and well, um, I, I worked for you. <laughs> so uh, that's right. Um, that was when I was in inter international. Um, but then my last gig was actually in Monterey Affairs. Um, so, which is more the heart of, of the Fed even. Um, and, you know, I haven't been there for 11 years, so they're 12 years now. Um, but uh, uh, my sense is, and I, I actually did want to bring this up because John raised this earlier. Um, I think John is onto something. I think you're right, John, that putting this in perspective shows how timid they are, really, compared to history. Uh, I, I think they have gotten a little bit too wrapped up in uh, a discussion with the bond market and with financial markets and trying to sort of maneuver policy relative to what people think and not get too far ahead of what markets are thinking and not surprise markets too much. I think they were scarred by the taper tantrum um, back in 2013. Um, and I think they have veered too far to the other side to try to minimize surprising markets. And I think, I think you're right. I think it, it's not that long ago in 2003 that they launched a tightening that was 25 basis points every meeting, which is what you're asking for, John. And it went on for, I think, three years. Uh, and at the time, it was viewed as being incredibly patient. And many people said too patient and too slow. And yet it would be, that would be much faster than what they're talking about this year. So I do think we have to put it in perspective. I, I kind of agree with you, John. I think if, I think the neutral rate is, is um, zero in real terms and probably two in nominal terms. So uh, I think that getting back to two ought to be a no brainer quickly. And then they can reassess. Uh, and, and on top of that, there's the balance sheet, um, you know, some people think it doesn't matter, but I do. Uh, and I think that, you know, the balance sheet is, is sort of larger than the market expects in the long run and sort of weighing on long rates. And I think that that's also an easing. So in some sense, uh, neutral is not only two, but two with a somewhat smaller balance sheet. Uh, and so until they get to those places, they're still, I think, on the accommodative side, accommodative side and it seems like you wouldn't want to be accommodative right now. Uh, and it wouldn't be too dangerous to get to neutral quickly and then go from there. So yeah, I'm, 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 here, I'm with you, John. Although I think the other thing that, that's in their mind is just that they, they were continually undershooting their inflation target for so long that even though now they've overshot it on the other side, and as you pointed out, um, 
you know, by quite a bit, although I, I think they might want to go back more than just three years. But, uh, you know, even if you go back to, to the Great Recession, they're, they're certainly, I think, basically back on track with where they would have wanted to be. So they could, it seems to me that even in their new framework, uh, they could justify a, a more rapid pace of tightening. And I do think that they're worried perhaps a bit too much about financial markets, but I don't know. I mean, everyone will castigate them if, you know, the stock market tanks. So, you know, I don't know what to say uh, to that, except that they should do what they think is best um, for the real economy, like you said, John. I, you know, even John's proposal, by the way, we'd have expansionary monetary policy for two years. If it matters with a lag, that means basically through 2024, we would continue to be supporting an economy, an economy that could be a few months away from maximum um, employment. So, you know, it's far and away the most hawkish proposal out there. Um, and it's quite dovish in some sense. Um, I do think two things that are a little bit missing from the conversation is um, interrelated things. The neutral rate is much lower than it was before. I mean, John, you showed us the nominal Fed funds rate earlier over the last 40 years. Um, the real Fed funds rate was lower than that because we used to have higher inflation and expected inflation. And I think the neutral rate has come down. I wouldn't even be surprised if it was one. Uh, I'm sorry. I wouldn't be shocked if it was one in nominal terms and minus one um, in real terms. I, that's not my best guess, but I wouldn't be shocked about that. And, you know, I place a lot of weight on you know, 2018, 2019, 2020. We had decent growth, decent employment growth, uh, low unemployment in this country with massive, not massive, with, with sizable fiscal support and a lot, a lot of monetary support. And so we are where we are now as a function of the low rates. We don't quite know where we'd be as a function of higher rates. Um, and I do think the Fed needs to take the bond market into account insofar as the bond market is going to impact um, the economy itself. So, you know, for me, lifting off in March, going every other meeting, um, we might even be at neutral in a year if we did something like that. And if we are, you know, if this ended us up with 3.2% inflation at the end of it, I don't view that um, as a tragedy. Um, the place where though, I think our loss function should be very asymmetric, the gains from going from three and a half to 3% unemployment, I think are quite small compared to the loss if you had a recession. And, you know, going from three and a half to three, it's partly marginal workers, the most disadvantaged, it's also partly people who are the most indifferent about working. They, they sort of don't really want to work, but you high, heat things up so much that they take jobs. Um, to increase the probability of a recession by 10% in order to do that, where recession is millions of people losing jobs who really did want to work uh, and who are the most vulnerable workers. So I think if you're focused on the most vulnerable, I think you do want to be asymmetric and being greedy about that extra couple percentage points on the, a couple tenths of a percent on the unemployment rate at the cost of, you know, imperiling and creating instability for all sorts of people in the future, um, I think is, is unacceptable and, and sort of not what a full employment Fed should be about. So just to, to expand on that argument, what you're suggesting is that if the Fed tried to get to 3% unemployment, there'd be higher inflation and they'd risk having to cause a recession in the future to lower the inflation? Is that the... Yeah, a recession either to control the inflation or you'd get a set of asset bubbles associated with it that you might prick when you normalize rates or um, something like that. And I just think there's a... You know, and, and, and I didn't... I don't know, I still don't know exactly how to think about this. Part of me, when the unemployment rate goes from three and a half to three, I'm thrilled because I'm picturing the most disadvantaged worker in our country who could not get hired at three and a half and now could at three. But part of me is predicting, picturing the 56 year old retiree who was sort of not sure whether or not they wanted to work, was right at the margin, had a high reservation wage and now they're brought in. And you know, so what are the welfare gains of someone working? Um, in our micro model, you wouldn't say if you go from a job that if you go from unemployment to making 40,000, you got a 40,000 gain. You'd say you got 40,000 minus whatever your alternative activity was. 
And in a reception, thinking of it as a $40,000 gain seems about right. You're sort of involuntarily unemployed. You would have loved to have had a job. You couldn't get one. At a time like now, I don't think we should think of the welfare gains of people being employed, uh, you know, valued at the face value that they show up in GDP, because I think they're giving up something else that they value. Um, I don't quite know how to reconcile the sort of micro welfare analysis with the you know, macro hot economy oak and join people in. Sorry, now I'm just getting towards the end. Yeah. Oh, talking about what I don't understand. So um, just maybe one thing um, on this debate or, or this, this point. Um, I, I think there is this tension between, on the one hand, you know, learning from the past, you know, which is a good thing. And on the other hand, fighting the last battle. Um, and, you know, the Fed may think it's learning from the past in terms of being patient and not preemptively tightening and that kind of stuff that maybe we did too much of in the past. But I worry that we've gotten to the point where we are fighting the last battle um, that, you know, uh, they undershot for a while and they're still kind of scarred from this undershooting for a while, even though those were tiny undershots. Um, and, you know, they, you know, we, we teach our students that central bankers are people that are willing to take the punch bowl away when the party is getting heated up. And, you know, they really do have to be those people at some point. If I could just say one thing, I, I don't want to go on record as fully supporting uh, John's uh, program of immediately raising at the next meeting and every single meeting this year. But uh, I would say that one, one reason why what they're doing isn't so bad, John, uh, is that they, they're, they're, they're moving perceptibly to financial markets. And the key, I think, is for them to uh, make clear that they will do whatever it takes ultimately. And as long as they can keep saying that and keep saying that, you know, if inflation doesn't go down as we expect, we will do more and keep you know, repeating that and acting on it as needed, I think they can keep expectations anchored. I, I, I think it's gonna be maybe better than, than you fear, but I, I, do, I, do, I do understand the big worry here. Um, I was saying that I think that it seems incredibly slow what they're doing, but you know, they're turning a super tanker, they're communicating to markets, they are moving in the right direction. It's clear that they're focused on the right things. It seems to me that is what matters. Uh, and they have the luxury, I think, of continuing to ramp things up if needed. And if, if we are all right on our work inflation worries, they will be doing more than three hikes this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's my sympathetic read of what they're doing is that they're pivoting in steps and that at the January meeting, they're gonna pivot more and actually they're gonna be more than three changes, you know, whether it's eight, I mean, I don't think there's gonna be eight, but you know, if it, you know, I would, my forecast is more like four or five or something. I, I would like to see more than that, but, but that would be the sympathetic view that they're pivoting in steps for the reasons Joe was mentioning. So we just have a couple more minutes if, if anyone wants to make any, any final remarks. Speaking for myself, a certain amount of what I've said on this panel uh, will turn out to be wrong. It's possibly even Joe and John might turn out to be wrong. And so, you know, I think one of the lessons of the past year was humility and trying to understand the consequence of your errors and correct them um, in real terms. The Fed, frankly, was a few months behind that error correction, but only a few months behind. And I don't think that's a catastrophic uh, amount of being behind the curve. So uh, we just all need to uh, keep uh, make sure we keep open minds and, and keep updating. Yeah, I mean, on, on my side, even though I'm arguing kind of maybe the most extreme thing about what they should do in 2022, I think I should not be misconstrued as saying that they made big mistakes in 2021. Um, you know, I, I think the average inflation targeting logic makes a you know it makes sense they, they should have been patient i think it made sense to think that maybe it would be temporary so it's a very different thing to disagree with 
what they're saying they will do next year than to say that they made big mistakes in 2021, which I don't actually think is the case. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm with you. The, given the mistake they had made in the other direction for so long and the unknowns of COVID, they did the right thing. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with what they did in 2021, but um, I was a little, you know, they're moving in the right direction and that's what matters. Let me just say I agree with that as well. I think I may have come across earlier as being more more hawkish than than I am. I think there's there, they, I, I don't blame them for 2021. We'll we'll see what happens in in the coming year. Anyway, we we are out of time. I want to uh, thank our panelists so much. This was was really fantastic. And thanks to everyone who who asked a question at the Q and A. And apologies to those of you who we we weren't able to to get to your question. Um, we we did appreciate getting all the questions. Um, and with that, uh, we will uh, adjourn.